we just saw that the law of motion in deterministic systems could be either a flow or a map. So let's discuss flows in a little more detail. So for infinitesimal times, you think of a flow as a curve through a space. So for a very short instant in time, that curve has a tangent. So here is a trajectory at time t, we are here, and at the, that instant we have a tangent to the curve, and that tangent is called velocity field at point x at point time. So flows are described by generalization of what we mean by velocity in very general settings. It's, um, we just take the first derivative respect to time, that's a parameter of this curve, and we call it velocity field. So the example you're familiar when, is it, when somebody tells you what Newton's law for mechanical systems are, they tell you that there is a velocity, which is a change of position, and then you also have to specify acceleration, which is the change of the velocity. And this field here, this field here, in Newtonian case, would be change of position and acceleration or change of momentum. Now, this is much more general than Newtonian mechanics. So whenever you think of flow, the way it's described almost always is by specifying such time-independent vector field. Now, that's easy to say, but it can turn out to be reasonably difficult. So if you're looking at fluid dynamics, we have equations, we can compute trajectories, but this velocity field might be something much harder than what you're used to. It is not this velocity of a packet of the fluid. It's actually combination of such velocities for all material elements over the liter of the fluid. So the thing could be difficult, but let's look at very simple examples first. The simplest example that's popular in the literature is called Duffing system. This is a very old set of equations which were introduced in the 20s and 30s to describe what uh, tubes did in, in old radios and amplifiers, so old vacuum tubes. And the simplest version of it is some phenomenological equation. The main thing about this equation is that it has some parameters, which, uh, you know, a phenomenological thing having to do with this particular tube that evolution of, here are only two variables, but evolution of this variable depends on the other one, this one depends on the mixture of both, and most importantly, it depends on a cube of the other variable, and whenever you see something that has larger than first power, this is nonlinear. And while linear physics is not as easy as people might think, because all quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is in some sense linear, it turns out the simplest nonlinear equations are much, much richer than anything you would expect from what you have learned in classical mechanics, etc. So in this particular example, what you can do is you can just put this little vector field on a computer and you can just plot it at every point. So here are two visualizations. At every point, here, 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 we plot a little arrow whose magnitude in x direction is the value of where you are and y direction is this function. Uh, that doesn't depend on time, they're just property of the state space. So whenever this vector field only depends on state space, not time, the flow is called autonomous, and we will only study autonomous flows because the non-autonomous flows are much harder than what we want to do, discuss here. So you can visualize the vector field as a bunch of points. That's okay for two-dimensional problems. It gets very hard, or in three dimensions, to put at every point a three-dimensional <laughs> three vector field. 
gets almost impossible later on. But in two dimensions world, we can see. So here are two visualizations. One is you just put vector fields. Other ones, you put little sperms whose tails are longer if they're faster. And what you can see that there's some kind of swirling. And if you take one of the points and you integrate it, go to the next vector field and just follow the position of the vector field. In this case, it'll turn out that you know, something will happen. You'll keep going, keep going, and you actually end up in a fixed point, one or the other. Now, the fancier way of saying what these vector fields are to call them a tangent bundle. So the way the flows are described is you have a state space, which is all possible states specified by D numbers, like weather in Chicago by million numbers. And at every state point, uh, you have a law of motion that tells you which way you will go. That's another vector of the same dimensionality, and that vector is tangent, so there is a tangent. And the collection of all these vectors is called tangent bundle, which I think is quite descriptive of the, what dynamics of flows is. Now, uh, we have integrations, so you will do exercises where you integrate this kind of motions, and what they do is, in time, your original state changes and it moves in a state space on a unique curve, which is called the trajectory. So you're moving on a unique trajectory in one dimension, monotonically. If you slow down and stop, you arrive at fixed points and you have a very boring future ahead of you. So that's a trajectory. So this is a sort of segment of some curve, which starts at time zero and adds at time t one. Now, what will be very important for us is a long time behavior of dynamical systems. And to do that, it's very convenient to define the notion of the orbit. Orbit is the totality of motions you can reach. So in this particular case, I don't really know what the orbit will be. It's something, it goes and does something, does something. And maybe if it exactly comes back, there'll be an example of orbits. So these are all states that this curve can reach in infinite time. That's orbit of x. So that's a subset of points of state space. So state space is thousand dimensional. In it, there is a curve, which is undimensional. And through each point, is, there is a unique curve, because this is determinism. Everybody has unique future and past. The collection of these orbits is actually filling out your state space with a bowl of spaghetti, if you will. So your state space is actually, once you have a dynamics, it's not just a bunch of inert points, it's actually a bunch of curves. And they are orbits, they are all possible things. An orbit, it doesn't matter what you label the orbit with. You can label it here, or you can label it here, or you can label it here. Any point will be good enough to label an orbit because every point on this orbit has the same orbit. So really the world is divided in orbits and not points the moment you have dynamics. So from now on we'll be trying to figure out you know, what does this bowl of spaghetti looks like. Orbit is a subset of points and it has a property that orbit is dynamically invariant if I have a set of points, and again, it's easiest for me to draw a curve, and they trace out the orbit, meaning this guy goes in time t to here, this guy goes in time t to here. So each point, x1, x2, x3, each point is moving on the orbit, but the orbit as a set is invariant. The time cannot change it. And that'll be our whole strategy. We'll divide our state space in which stuff is moving all over the place, and we'll try to partition it in sets of invariant objects, objects that don't change in time. This is the simplest example, a periodic orbit. A reasonable question to ask is, what kind of trajectories can we have, or orbits? Uh, it turns out this question is a fool's errand. What you're asking is, you know, what are all possible solutions of all possible dynamical systems, known or unknown, imagined or unimaginable, 
And we know that, you know, every time we open a scientific journal, there are new dynamical systems being written down because people are trying to explain new phenomena. So you can pretend that you know what you're talking about. You can say, well, it's very obvious. Either nothing happens. In that case, my state is stationary. Time passes by, but I actually stay at the same spot. That's called equilibrium or many other names for all time. Okay, but you know, we're interested in dynamics. And in dynamics, obviously, something should be happening. But don't knock the equilibria because they'll turn out to be quite important for us. So the other obvious thing, and that's how the whole story got started, you know, the people who were looking at the heavens so clockwork that look very periodic to them. You know, things looked almost periodic. They were periodic unless you looked very carefully. So the first description of our universe was to say the planets, stars, etc., move on periodic orbits. That means that you start someplace and exactly time TP later you know, 763.5406 seconds later, you're back where you started. That's a periodic orbit. And indeed, the first thing you learn when you learn Newtonian mechanics, you learn about Keplerian ellipses. They're beautiful examples of periodic orbits, but we can compute this number to arbitrary precision. Totally amazing precision. But very quickly, the ancients realized, no, the clockwork is more complicated. So the cheap cop-out is to say that all possible orbits are either stationary or periodic or aperiodic. Now, the vast of aperiodic, the world of aperiodic orbits, meaning orbits, orbits in which you start someplace so you start at point X, and you start going. You go and go, your trajectory does this, and does that, and does this, and does that, 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 and comes close, but doesn't quite make it, comes close, etc. That's an example of a periodic orbit. Mathematically impossible to prove that orbit will not come back exactly, but you know, intuition says this is very likely if you're in dimensions higher than two or three. It's very hard to throw a boomerang even in three dimensions and gets harder later. So we have to get a little more serious about periodic orbits.